Hey everyone, welcome back to Peak Human. I'm Brian Sanders. Make sure you go back and start episode one. So much great content out there in the backlogs. Also, share with family and friends. Give it a review on iTunes or the podcast app. All free ways to help this podcast spread. You can follow me at Food Lies on any social media outlet. That's on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Just search Food Lies. I'll be there. Try to post something useful every day. So now on to the show with Patrick Toit. Patrick is an amazing guy. He's an engineer. He is a scientist. He's a biochemist. He's done a ton of great work on his own to reverse his heart disease. He actually reversed his CAC score. So if you haven't heard of that, it's a coronary artery calcium score, which in the mainstream is thought to progressively gets worse and is not possible to reverse. But in a few cases, it has been reversed. And Patrick is one of them. He spent over 16,000 hours of his own time researching. It's been well over a decade. He's obviously highly invested in his research because he has saved his own life. And he's putting out a lot of great info out there to help save other people's lives and help look at the root cause of heart disease, why it happens, how to stop it, and not only stop it, but reverse it. It's crazy. I remember Dr. Brett Schur, an interview I did many years ago, he said it can't be reversed or it's highly unlikely. And guess what? He was wrong. This hasn't been studied much because no one knows about it. No one does all the tests that Patrick's done. He's spent tens of thousands of dollars on all these tests over the years and no one tracks all this data and coordinates with his doctors and does so much of his own research and time into this stuff. So really cool stuff. He's a wealth of information. He's a fellow engineer. He's a really interesting guy. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. And I'll tell you, this podcast is brought to you by none other than Nose to Tail, my own company, my own ranchers, my friends, my family ranchers that grow all the great grass and forage that the animals eat on wild rangeland. This is all here in Texas. We ship it out to you. That's at nose to tail.org. Support them support this show, support the Food Lies film that I'm making while I do all these podcast episodes and do all my interviews and keep up on all the latest research so I can fit it in the six part series that we're doing. I know it's taking forever. We're getting there little by little every day. We're working hard. I just did an interview today with Jessica Thompson who has been a guest on the show recently. Yes, we're still working hard. We're still on Indiegogo. Actually, you can go to Indiegogo, find us there, Food Lies. You can go to foodlies.org, but back to nose to tail. Nose to Tail is making this all possible. We have all the meats, bison, beef, lamb, chicken, pork. We have the organ meats. We have the bones. We have bone broth. We have the low pufa chicken and pork. Our pigs and chickens are raised outdoors on pasture, low pufa diet, no corn, no soy, no GMO, organic feed. All of our cattle are raised the same way on wild forage land. Same thing with the bison and lamb. It's the best stuff that I think you can get. So you can order it for yourself. You'll have it soon in Austin. We'll be having the Nose to Tail location soon, which is actually the Sapien Ancestral Health and Wellness Center that I keep mentioning on these shows. Contact me if you'd like to get involved. We got a bunch of people involved today. It's a community project. We're doing it with the community. It's all powered by us. We're putting in our own money and making it happen. So reach out to me. And the other products we have will also be on site in Austin and available online for now, like the Biltong, the Drovors, the Livervores, best way to get liver on the go. We have the great grass-fed, grass-finished beef in a convenient travel form without any nitrates, without high temperature dehydration, without sugar. This is the best stuff. It's from South Africa originally, but I have a great South African guy making it with me in North Carolina. Ships it out straight to you. Doesn't sit around in a warehouse. So get that now. We're just getting our Livervores back in stock. We have the other Biltong options with the different flavors available. We have the body care in stock, like the soap and the lip balm. And within a week, we will have some skin food for some lucky people who order it quickly before we get in our big order. Again, this stuff is great. It's made from beef tallow, regeneratively raised. Tommy makes most of it by hand. Very simple ingredients, just what your body wants. Some good saturated fat. That's all at nosetail.org. Also the seasonings, we have it all. You can get your seasonings, you can get your hats even. Get your steak hat, get the T-bone hat, get the nose to tail hat. Thanks so much for supporting us. We're doing this all high quality boutique operation here. Support the show by supporting nose to tail or by sharing this podcast with a friend or family, giving a review on iTunes, listening to all the old episodes, and enjoying this one with Patrick Toit.
Hey, hey. Hello, everyone. We're back with Patrick Toit. How are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you for having me on your podcast. Appreciate it, man. Absolutely. We had a great talk the other day, got to know each other a little, and let's introduce the audience to you a little more. Can you tell us what kind of degrees you have, what kind of background you have, please? Uh, just wrapping up my PhD in leadership from the University of the Cumberlands, uh, uh, master's in biochemical engineering, uh, a tier one MBA, master's in statistics, and uh, four undergraduate majors and three minors back way back when college was college. Uh, just retired from the paper industry after 47 years, where I've been mill managers, production managers, tech managers, and all that other happy stuff. And most people will say, it's paper. Well, yeah, uh, think about it this way. Walk out in your yard, cut down a maple tree, and four hours later, make uh, some sheets of paper for your copy machine. That's what we do. And the biochemistry associated with that and the, and the engineering is, is staggeringly complicated. And, but it's, it's, if, if you like puzzles, it's hog heaven. So, mm. Well, I'm a mechanical engineer. We bonded over our engineering backgrounds and our engineering <clears throat> mindsets. So, Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I do think that really helps because people, some say, well, you're not a doctor or you're not a nutrition PhD. And I said, well, I mean, that could be a good thing, really, <laughs> not to demean people. You know, some people are, are really great at what they do, but there's a lot of, you know, sort of soft science done in the nutrition world, I think. Yeah, it, th and that's very true. And it's not a shot. And by the way, I'm not a doctor. I don't prescribe. I don't diagnose. I don't do any of that. Uh, you and I have a shared way of looking at things, which is called root cause failure analysis and analytical problem solving. And that is a technique that we learned way back in our start in the engineering world. And that technique, I don't want to say supersedes, but adds more flavor to the solutions to nutritional issues. I think we have a different perspective on the same mountain. And I think it's refreshing myself. Well, it's good because I think there's a certain system that's been set up in the medical field and the textbooks have been written a certain way and the studies have been funded a certain way where mm -hmm. doctors just see this tunnel vision. They kind of just see the pharmaceutical industry view, just like, how mm -hmm. can we get a pill? How can we do a surgery? And so it's, it's actually beneficial that we didn't come from that view. That's right. And, and you, you throw on top of that what we've learned over the years, uh, the Demaic concept from uh, Six Sigma, you know, design, measure, analyze, and all that stuff. We just do that instinctively. And to your point, the conventional medical world just doesn't do that for a whole host of reasons. And uh, quite frankly, I, I'm happy I'm in the United States. Our medical system and pharmaceutical system is fantastic if something breaks. Our system sucks at keeping it from breaking. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And, and think about it this way. In, in your mechanical world, if you're going to line a pump and a motor together, you first line it up to within a few thousandths, and then you put on vibration analysis to make sure the bearings are right, and the temperature uh, analysis equipment to make sure the lubrication is correct, and then you monitor your amps and this, that, and the other thing, so as to anticipate it about to break, rather than just simply say, well, we hooked it up and we hope it runs. It, two different mindsets. Both work. One works in the short term. The other one works in the long term. So it's, you know, it's kind of like Ivor Cummins and I. We, we've come to agreement on that's how engineers look at things. Well, yes, Ivor, or yeah, I call him Ivor um, Cummins. People know him. He's been on my show twice. He's amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, you were on his show. I know that. And yes, he has that same type of thinking. And we have the same opinion of the the medical industry of I mean, we don't, we're preaching to the choir here. Everyone listening knows that the medical system is set up in kind of the opposite way. So let's talk about your story though. So you had okay. a high CAC score. I just want to refresh the audience. Uh, Ivor Cummins talked about this a long time ago, this, the calcium score. So uh, take it away. Okay. Here's the story. Uh, back in the day, this is in 2002. The head of psychology, the vice chair of psychology at the Mayo Clinic, and the head of cardiology at the Mayo Clinic, the three of us got our MBAs together at Carlson. And they 
kept encouraging me to get an executive physical at the Mayo Clinic. And honest to God, I'm here to tell you, if it wasn't for the Mayo Clinic, I'd be dead. And, you know, hats off to those guys. So it's a three-day executive physical. Think about that. Three days of this. Oh, my God. So I go through the whole thing, pass it with flying colors, because back in, I've always been an athlete. And it's, it's like, okay, I go through all this. Everything's fine. And then one hour before I go to lunch, my attending personal care physician, you get assigned one. So she leads you around this maze called the Mayo Clinic. And uh, I and she says, I have to ask you, would you like something else done to you? And I looked at her and, and you know, being an, an ex-hockey player, I, I could have made some rather off-color comment, but I just decided. I says, yeah. I says, I was driving through Chicago a couple of months ago and they talk about this thing called a calcium score. Do you guys do that? And she says to me, and I'll do I'll do honesty and, and sincerity. Now, this is not bashing. This is just how fate starts stuff, you know. And she said, well, why would you want that? All of your tests are fine. I said, well, didn't you say you have to do what I ask? Yeah. I says, let's get one done. So I get it done. And they had an EBT scanner there. And uh, the guy who did my... my uh, colonoscopy was running the scanner and I walk in here. He looks at me. I look at him and I says, Oh, we meet again. <laughs> he starts laughing. <laughs> so I get the scan done. I, I go to lunch. I'll never forget what I had for lunch. It was a pot roast, potatoes, gravy, green beans, and a shooper of beer. And I just kind of relaxed like, Oh my God, this is all over with. And I was going to my exit interview with, with the, with the, uh, analysis team there. And, uh, I walk into the conference room and I sit down and I look around the room. There are about oh, eight, 10 doctors there and, and my, my two buddies. And I said, God, it looked like somebody just died. And the head of psychology starts chuckling. And he said, Pat, you were, you're always the master of the understatement. I said, well, what happened? So they put on my slide deck from my CT scan. And there, as we went through the sagittal sections of my heart, now, a background, I was a pre-med undergrad, so I'm very familiar with medical terminology and all this other happy stuff. Uh, and, I, and I got to my left main, and it glowed like a rib. And I was sitting there looking at this, and I went, oh, that doesn't look good. <laughs> <laughs> and, they, and, doc, and the head of cardiology kind of rolled his eyes and said, it's not. Oh, okay. <laughs> so they basically, my left main was completely calcified from the wall of the heart to the branch, score 337. And I went for a follow-up stress echo the next week. And needless to say, between then and then, I was slightly nerved up because that's kind of a surprise. And I passed my stress echo, and right next to the uh, treadmill I was on was a crash cart, and people gowned up to take me to the ER in or the operating room in case I crashed. Uh, I passed uh, passed that with flying colors. So I'm from Upper Michigan. We're called Youpers, and we're kind of a, a an easy going bunch of dudes. And I kind of went well. I sat down with my attending cardiologist, great guy, uh, love the guy, uh, great guy, fantastic. And he said, uh, I, well, this is your score. You passed your strike. Let's go. I says, well, what's the problem? And he said, well, let me explain to you what the problem is. So we went through my genetic history, and this is where genetic history is very important. Uh, on my mother's side of the family, virtually everybody died of heart disease. The men died typically under the age of 55 all of arterial blowouts. And he said, you're heading for an arterial blowout because in some cases, when you have calcification, the diameter of your artery increases in size, the ID. So the wall of the pipe gets thinner. So I, I refer to arteries as pipes. So the pipe gets thinner. And you and I both know thin pipes and pressure fluctuations, they don't play well together. And I took a deep breath and I went, oh, Lord, that ain't good. And he, so he said, well, I says, what can you do for me? Well, 
you need a bypass, but we can't give you a bypass until you have a heart attack. But if you have a heart attack, your artery blew out. I says, okay. <laughs> and he says, well, you got 20 minutes before you're dead. I said, so in other words, I'm dead. He said, yes, basically. He says, We're, we give you about four years to live. And uh, this is his exact quote. And I hats off to this guy. I, I, I just hats off to these folks. He said, divorce your wife, buy a Harley, find a bimbo, drive out to Venice Beach and sell surfboard wax for the next four years because you have worked your butt off all your life. You've done well and you deserve to at least uh, sail off into the sunset. And I said, well, thank you for that piece of advice. But my body, and this is exactly what I said to him, my body got me into this mess. My body can get me out of this mess. And he didn't really understand my background and all that business. So after the meeting, he talked to my two friends and I talked to them as I exited. Thank you. Thank you very much. I says, I've got my work cut out for me. And uh, my two, and so this attending cardiologist said, the guy's in denial. He's saying his body can fix this. Mm. And my two friends said, we will bet you $500 that he's alive in four years. So he took the bet. <laughs> And in four, in two and a half years, my left main was completely cleared out from the wall to the branch, completely clear. Wow. And uh, so, you know, needless to say, uh, as you well know, in the engineering world, when, when people of our ilk get focused on things, we really get focused. And I basically started, that would be Thanksgiving of 20, of 2002, Thanksgiving night of 2002, I started reading between four and eight hours a night of medical stuff on the internet. Not This is all peer-reviewed literature. I'm, I'm kind of geeky that way. If it ain't peer-reviewed, I take it with a serious grain of salt. And so I just kept reading and reading and reading and reading because I had four kids at home. I was married. Uh, I don't want to exit like my Uncle Carl at age 52 or my Uncle Johnny at age 48. My Uncle Johnny at or Uncle Joey at 61. I just didn't want that. My mother, she had died of an arterial blowout. I didn't need that either. So, okay, I got my work cut out for me. It was interesting. Uh, think back then the internet had just geeky stuff on it for the most part. So I could, and since I have a background in reading geeky stuff, associated with biochemistry, biophysiology, and all that, because I also coach athletes, so I'm and I coach myself, and so I'm, I'm really into this kind of stuff. I really sailed through the literature understanding what was going on. And keyword searches, I was on the forensics and debate team for four years in college, so I knew how to research. I knew how to, you know, sail through stuff. It also helps that I have, I've been accused of having a pretty close to an didactic memory. So if I read something 20 years ago, I still remember it, or the, the salient points of it. So by the second week of January of 2003, I wrote my buddy in Tiburon, California, and I said, he was suffering from some heart disease issues, and I said, heart disease is a gut bacteria problem. How do you like them apples? This is January of 2003. Wow. And I went, okay. So by April of 2003, I had pretty much come up with the multi-headed dragon of heart disease, which I sent you a, a picture of. And that's and that was by April of 2003. In the meantime, between Thanksgiving and mid-April of 2003, I was working at getting my diet squared away for starters. Being that I was a a really good athlete back in the 60s and 70s, a ketogenic diet was I, they didn't have a word for it back then. Back then, we just said don't eat junk food, and I, I was not a junk food fiend. Never was. So dialing in my body was pretty easy. So I absolutely refrained from anything that approached a cheap carb. My body craved broccoli and sauerkraut for some odd reason back then. I didn't understand it until 2010. And it was off to the races. So two and a half years later, my pipes are, that pipe is cleaned out. In the meantime, the... Remember, this is a this is a process, and you and I both know processes are processes. It's just not the pipe, it's not the valve, it's just not the motor, it's just not the pump, it's everything. So the totality of it was I had more calcium coming on because it was growing at a rate of rate around for me, it was 50% per year. That's pretty bad. 
So you really got to get on this one. So I jumped on it and uh, by, well, three years later, four years later, I had pretty much, I was down to a score of like, oh, I think 120 because I had it popping up in other arteries just because of the process. Mm -hmm. And it was on the downside. I was feeling really good. And now what I'm about to say, I'm going to preface this way. I am not an anti-vaxxer. I'm an engineer. Uh, root cause failure analysis, something broke in the system. You know, the phrase, what changed? Mm -hmm. What changed in the process? And you and I both know when somebody says, oh, nothing. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> mm, yeah. It's not really so, possible. Yeah. All right. So I was going to Russia with my son. He was going to do some training at the Moscow training center with the Russian Olympic team in, in the 400. And uh, we were going to go for a month and he would, he was between his freshman and sophomore years of high school, a good runner. And well, the personal care physician said, Pat, you're going to a, basically a third world country. You need to get your MMR vaccination. And at the time, I wasn't wise to it. So I said, okay. You know, I trusted him. And he was well-intentioned. No, you know, no, no, no issues there. And I had already had measles. I had already had rubella. I never had mumps. Well, I got the jab. And apparently, you know, piecing all the pieces together, my calcium score went from about 120, 200, somewhere in there up to 800 in six months. Wow. Wow. And my insulin went from like five to 48. Whoa. And at the time I was working with Dr. Bill Davis of Wheat Belly fame. Yeah. William holistic Davis. MD cardiologist. Great yeah. guy. In fact, I would not be alive today if it wasn't for Bill. Great guy. Just super guy. Anybody, I highly recommend reading his books. Excellent guy. Top drawer. And uh, uh, <laughs> Bill looked at my numbers and he went, what have you been doing? Were you on a Caribbean cruise eating pizza every day? My mm. God. I says, no. Being an engineer, you're pretty anal about routine. You know, you, if you mm. know it works, you keep it up, you know. So one thing led to another and I started reaching at what changed. I got a vaccination. So I researched vaccinations. Oh, my God. Well, my diet up until then was unbelievably consistent because like anything else, when you need change, you need to be consistent about it, be rational about how you, you're very deliberate about change and rational about it. Well, upon further investigation, looping back to gut bacteria, the issue you have was the MMR apparently, and again, this is, I'm an N of one, so this doesn't apply to everybody, mm -hmm. but my system basically went crazy when the MMR jab was given to me. Now you go, why? Well, I, at that time, I was between 12 and 16 grams a day of vitamin C. Well, when you, and 10,000 to 15,000, I use a D. When you're at that level, your white blood cell count is really, really low because you're chemically killing critters in your blood. So your immune system can just kind of sit back and kick back and think about somebody on a cruise ship drinking a Mai Tai, sunning themselves and it's 80 degrees out and they're mm -hmm. and sun and you're just chilling. Mm -hmm. Well, that jab basically was like pouring cold water on me while I'm laying there on the chaise lounge. My system basically had an immune panic and it just started attacking things. And one of the things that apparently attacked was the bacteria that are associated with liberating vitamin K1 from the broccoli and liberating the MK7 from the sauerkraut and rejiggering both of those to the Ks that I needed to survive. This is only in retrospect. I, I didn't understand it at the time, but I mm -hmm. knew something wasn't right, and I knew it had to do with bacteria because the odor of my stools changed, and which I thought, what? no, that's weird. Uh, so one thing leads to another. Uh, I first had to get my di my pre-diabetes, my diabetes under control, which is type two. And Dr. Bill Davis said, 
fact, here's the literature on dealing with type 2 diabetes. I said, Bill, my body got me into this mess. My body mm-hmm. can get me out of this mess. So what I did, and again, I'm an N of 1. I, I did research on how to get your di- how to fix your pancreas, basically. So at the time, there was a chelated vanadium available. And I started taking that. And now you go, why is that? Well, as it turns out, back before insulin, people took vanadyl sulfate, which was terribly tough on your bowels, to manage your sugar. So the logic is this. I could be wrong, but here's the logic. Your body replaces all the cells and all of your organs in three to five years. So my bet was if I take the stress off my pancreas, the pancreas can repair itself in such a way that I should be fine in about three years. So I basically took a three-year whatever in taking vanadium. Vanadium's tough in your kidneys, so you got to really watch that. My uh, GFR dropped about 15, 20%. So you got to be careful, really, you know, don't hurt yourself. And in three years, I weaned myself off of it. And guess what? My insulin numbers came down to five or six, and my sugar was normal and everything was fine. Well, this was long about 2010. And I, the pr- progress of my disease, because I managed my insulin, slowed way down but it was still increasing at about 17% per year. It's still growing. And if it's growing, it's not good. Think about this. It's cancer of your pipes, for Mm -hmm. lack of a better description. I like to put things in simple terms. Mm -hmm. So I, in 2010, I said, look it, I got to do something. So I sat down, took a week's vacation, and I sat in front of the computer. I put in about 110 hours of reading and rereading what I've already read looking at all of my blood work that I had gotten done. Now, up until that point, I was getting four blood draws a year. I think that was the average of between 30 and 60 tubes when I'd show up. Mm. I tested everything. And, you know, as an engineer, you test, 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 test. You have to. You're an engineer. That's what you do. Well, none of the tests were out of range. My C-reactor protein was less than 0.2. My HbA1c was 5.2. My... My, uh, one of the things that came up was my, uh, homocysteine was hovering around 11. It turns out I had from, I had a gene for folic acid metabolism that I found out. So I fixed that with uh, methylfolate. So that got that down to nine, which is great. Uh, my glucose was in the seventies and nineties, somewhere in there, but I have so much testing and I, and I would get between four CT scan, two to four CT scans per year because I was constantly testing myself. I think I've got 28 or 29 CT scans since 2002 because I love to measure things. In fact, I did two CT, two, an EBT scanner and CT scanner within one hour of each other just to see if the numbers were close. That's, hmm. that's how geeky wow. I am. <laughs> Dr. Davis said, Pat, don't you know that's dangerous? I said, Bill, I'm going to die anyway. It really doesn't matter. <laughs> It's the immediacy is the issue. <laughs> so I spent 110 hours reading through all this stuff and hats off to Mercola. I read an, uh, and uh, I just happened to stumble across an article by Mercola in 1999 talking about vitamin K1 and how it's implicated in heart disease. And I went, hmm, I'd never seen that before, but it tripped my trigger with regards to what Dr. Bill Davis told me about his Japanese mother who love to eat natto. And natto has got metoquinol 7 in it. And he just made an offhand comment to me. And he says, there seems to be a correlation there. But he says, I don't know what it is. And I went, huh. And I just, because at the time, I didn't know anything about K. I truly didn't. I was just, it was bad enough convincing the Mayo Clinic taking D was important. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That was fun. Wow. Back then they said normal was 20 nanograms per milliliter. Oh my God. I mean, says, I'm not, that's I'm so not low. Kidding. That's deficient. That's basically what, yeah, all this, what the recent COVID stuff is when people go to the hospital if they're in the 20. Exactly. Exactly. So it's like, why are you doing that? I mean, yes, you know, and, and now there was a reason for that. This is a little sidebar. So as I was doing my research, I, I found something from the World Health Organization. This is back in 2002, early 2003 that if you plot cardiovascular disease from the equator to the Arctic Circle, it goes up, 
goes up, goes up. And when it hits the Arctic Circle, it drops down. And I went, that's one of those my, my, my moments. So what's going on? Obviously, they don't get a lot of sun up there. <laughs> Obviously. So that prompted me to research, what do they eat? And it turns out the Inuit, back when they had a rational Inuit diet, they eat a lot of fats that guess what was in it? Vitamin D. Vitamin D. And just my, to let people my, know, my. I just want to make sure it's like, as you go away from the equator, there's less sun and there's more heart disease. And it, it's mm -hmm. just vitamin D is so important. And yeah, there's this, I mean, we could go on that for hours about that one, but I just wanted to oh, make sure they caught right. that. You're, you're, right. And, and another sidebar, there's a lot of, I'll just call it hooey out there about D. The Australian government wanted to put that to rest. So what did they do? They studied lifeguards. <laughs> Think about that. They're getting sun. And they averaged about 120 nanograms per milliliter. So the the Australian government said, yeah, that seems to be the top end of the range. But certainly 20 is not where you want to be. And then on top of that, there was a uh, study, a, a meta-analysis by, I think it was Johns Hopkins. And it's so, since been taken off the web and you can't find it. And it shows vitamin D level versus cancer. That was fascinating. Holy cow. As D drops, cancers go up. Yeah, it's just and it, it was the 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 inflection point was at fifty nanograms per milliliter and lower. Cancers go up exponentially based on uh, the lower you go, the higher it goes. But above that, it's 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 still there, but not statistically significant. You go far out, man. <laughs> that explains a lot of things. So, getting back to my 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 July of twenty ten. I see what Mercola said, and I remembered what Bill Davis said, and then I said, did I ever get a K-1 test? So Dr. Catherine Roth, hats off to her great holistic MD in Traverse City, Michigan. Catherine, just by just by whatever, she said, let's try, let's see what your K is doing. We're testing everything else. So I did. Turns out my K was at the below normal range. I went, my God. That's got to be it. So I started putting the pieces together. So I started, that's when I started jumping on K and I realized, oh my God, there it is. Now I had to get some K, but I had to get enough K to make this stuff work because the peer reviewed articles I read from like Sugars, Ramirez, Suddies, and that bunch, brilliant people. I said, well, to save my life, I need this, 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 and this. So now I, because back in 2010, there weren't a whole lot of people that sold vitamin K. K1 was out there. MK7, I think it was 50 micrograms. MK4, you could buy it in Japan at 20, 20 25 micro, milligrams, but you couldn't get it. They wouldn't ship it in the United States. So, so that got me on my mission <laughs> to, get, <laughs> to get some K. So what did I do in classic whatever? Well, where can you go to get vitamins? Well, go to a trade show that sells vitamins. <laughs> That'd be a good place to start. So I go to Las Vegas to Supply Side West in 2010. And I went around Supply Side West trying to score a key of various <laughs> vitamin Ks. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it was like, think about it. It was like Cheech and Chog up in smoke. You kind of like, hey, man, I'm trying to score some K. You got any good stuff? <laughs> Just, <laughs> I mean, what the? Yeah. It's like, so I got that. Got that all set up. I uh, had all my white powder in my kitchen. Mm -hmm. And I started making my own capsules for myself. And within, and what I had done, I did an experiment. If K is so important and your body loves it so much, I had a stash of, of statins. And uh, there was Crestor. I took 10 milligrams of Crestor, drove my LDL down to like 50. And I said, if my body loves K and K is carried on LDL and there's plenty of K, your body should make all the LDL it needs to carry the K, regardless if you're taking a statin or not. So I took the statin and, you know, I'm used to getting my blood drawn. So I'm doing, I do this for three months. I, my baseline was like 50 and bingo, 137 while well, I'm still taking a statin. And, and again, this is an N of one. And I went, cool, I think I'm onto something. So the next test is what? Take 
the stat in a way, keep the K at the same level, see what happens. I think it was 147. I went far out. I think I'm onto something here. And within six, eight months, my progression of my heart disease stopped. And another year started regressing. And I just been blowing and going ever since then. Uh, so long about 2013, uh, a number of NDs, MDs, holistic MDs said, you got to start telling people your story and you got to start, you know, sharing, sharing what you found. And I really didn't want to do that. I truly didn't want to do that. But, you know, I got kind of strong armed into it. I said, well, okay, I'll do this, but I'm going to do it my way. Uh, so, and, and the way is to make sure people understand it that don't have a biochemical background. Keep it simple. Keep the phraseologies. So like you're like like I said, you're at a tavern at a table with a couple of brewskis and you're talking to some friends. They just keep it keep it simple. Mm -hmm. And uh, ba basically, that's that's where I am today. Uh, my my heart disease has stopped. It's slowly regressing. Uh, uh, one of the things I learned with COVID, I was asymptomatic for it, but COVID induces hardening of the arteries, which is not cool. And I had a slight uptick with COVID. Uh, it, you know, my, it wabashed my girlfriend really bad. And, uh, but uh, me, I was asymptomatic for it. But I think I had a slight bump, you know, maybe 5%, but I'm, I'm fine now. Come back down. But anyway, that I, was two years ago. Well, it's great that you're asymptomatic because you had all your vitamin D levels and K and your health in check. I have so many yeah, questions. Right. I have so many sure, questions. Fire away. Well, first of all, what year in 2002, how old are you, were you and how old are you now? Uh, I'm going to be 69 this July 12th. Okay. In, so in 2002, 49. I was about 49. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So this... You caught the the heart disease progression right around when your relatives were were suffering in the or dying from it in the past. Actually, they were right. already dead. Yeah, and now mm -hmm. you're you're 69. Well, that's great. You had no problem with COVID, and you know you had your health dialed in, which is what I promote a lot: is take your health into your own hands. And I've never even had a symptom um, mm -hmm. in the past two years. I didn't even know I had it. I I was tested for it. And I found out by accident. It was kind of mm. like, well, okay whatever wow. you know and then okay so another thing why do you think you got this whole panel of tests the three days and everything looked good yet you had such a high cac score of 337 what what's going on why why can the medical system see this well the medical system has has convention for a whole host of reasons but it's just their convention uh, it's, it's again, uh, I, I think it has to do with insurance. Nobody wants to pay for tests. Uh, I can, I can safely say what my cousin said, who was the chief of surgeons at a real high muckety muck hospital chain in Detroit told me about calcium scores and why hospitals don't do it. The issue you have is if you have a patient with a CAC score of any kind, you put them on a statin, and after three years, they come back and they have a CAC score and it increases. The personal care physician, unfortunately, or the C cardiologist is put in a really a no-win situation because the patient says, I'm doing this. Why isn't it getting better? And again, it's, in my opinion, it's out of sight, out of mind. Uh, hell, a Mayo Clinic didn't even do an APOE status on me. Uh, God only knows, but so I had 23andMe do it, and then I sent my results to Prometheus, and they gave me all my analysis. Uh, it's just convention, and I think it has to do with cost, I, I, there, because there's no money in health. It just well, isn't, yeah. <clears throat> what my doctor friends tell me. So, Yeah, so people, that kind of just shows the statin isn't going to is, do much. It, you can see the progression. It's like you're attacking the wrong problem. Right. There's so many other things you can do with the diet and lifestyle that could have reversed your score, mm -hmm. but they're just saying, oh, we'll just take the statin, doesn't do anything. And then I remember actually talking to Ivor about why they don't do it. And he had some more grim answers of what, you know, just it, it just doesn't work mm -hmm. for them financially. I, I, I'll let people go back to that first episode I did with Ivor to, 
to hear him mm-hmm. talk about it. But a lot of weird stuff mm-hmm. with money, with politics, with the hospital administration, like actually saying, no, we don't want to do this test because it's not going to it's going to screw us on our, our margins or, you know, stuff like that. So I won't comment on that. I, I can I can add some more flavor to that. I, I got to talk with in 2016 a guy who was on the research team that first developed statins. And the original statin was supposed to have CoQ10 included in it. Mm. That's wow. the original patent. And, but they never did that because they knew that without the CoQ10, there would be additional symptoms that were manageable. My, my, my. Wow. Yeah. And people know that, yeah, statins deplete CoQ10. I mean, that's why now people mm-hmm. know people take supplements, right? Would they take supplements? When they yeah, take you, supplements? ubiquinol. Ubiquinol, yeah. typically. So... Well, I'm also curious why I think it's why you weren't diagnosed with any problems yet the CAC scored was also because our modern ranges, our idea of health is so off. We we take the average of population and we're like every the reference ranges are just based. A lot of them are based on just the average population. And I'm like, yeah, the po- average population is is obese and sick. Uh, you know, right. like why, why are we using that? So that's just it's a telltale sign that if we say that you are healthy based on all these other tests and then by a very, very precise, you know, look at your arteries, we see that it's completely blocked almost, right? right. And 337. Mm-hmm. So obviously you're not healthy. That just proved the whole system's broken of, of how we measure health. Right. That's correct. That's absolutely correct. Absolutely. It's it's crazy. Absolutely. And and Another thing I wanted to bring up, I had Dr. Brett Schur on a long time ago, probably four years ago, and I brought up a CAC score and I said something about reversing it and he even stopped and he's, you know, he's, he's in our space. He's good. You know, he's on mm-hmm. the same page with all the, you know, he doesn't believe the cholesterol stuff. Like he he's, he's counter to the narrative of the mainstream yet. He still said, Oh, whoa, 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 you can't reverse CAC. I remember this and he stopped me. He, he corrected me and and That's it's okay. crazy. It this is this this thought that you cannot reverse this your your calcium score. Right. Uh uh with the website that we, that I that me and my partner have, we cannot publish people's results. I've had people send in their before and after CT scans. I said publish this. I says I can't. I can anecdotally talk about it. Uh uh I got a couple of stories if if you don't mind. Yeah. This 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 these people were truly sincere. A guy named Toby, he was from South Carolina. Toby, mid seventies, both carotids were at ninety percent plugged. Mm. They, they, they wanted to rotor root his carotids, and Toby says the risk of that is worse than having carotid problems. So, unbelievably, he traded me a forty-four <laughs> Magnum Smith and Wesson revolver mm-hmm. for some vitamin K. I went, okay. So I shipped him, I think, 40 bottles or something. Like that. I didn't hear from him for two years. So out of the clear blue sky, he calls me up. He says, I got some good news. One carotid is at 10% and the other one's clear. I went, far out, man. He says, well, thank you. <laughs> that was, you know, Toby. Wow. Now, another lady, Myrtle. Myrtle from Mountain View, California. Myrtle went to, uh, I'll just say, a prestigious hospital near Mountain View. And she had her credits checked and they were both 70, 75%, according to Myrtle. And she's in her 80s, so why would she exaggerate? So she mm-hmm. was pretty upset and they said, we're not going to do anything for you. So go outside and just live the rest of your life. Kind of like what I, they said to me. Myrtle found the site three years ago and six months ago, she calls me up from the same prestigious hospital parking lot crying. And I'm, I'm a very sensitive kind of guy. I'm going, oh, my God, Myrtle, what, what happened? She says, I'm so happy. I said, what do you mean you're so happy? You're crying. She says, these are tears of joy. I says, okay, I'm listening. They're both clear. And in both cases, the doctors attending Toby and Myrtle said, we must have did the first test wrong. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yeah, it just, yeah. yeah no, right. And there's an MD in San Diego just called me up a couple of weeks ago. And he said his calcium score went from 60 some to zero in the last year. And he's just ecstatic. I said, well, cool. 
I, you know, I'm all for it. Again, these are ends of one and it's anecdotal. So you got to take it all with a grain of salt. But, you know, enough trees fall on the wood. Somebody's going to eventually hear one. So, mm -hmm. you know. Well, yeah. And, it, and it's, it's, it's again, but it's a lifestyle. You have to want to be basically ketogenic. You have to want to get your D right. You have to take ownership and extreme ownership in your health because it's a lifestyle change. And, that, and, and most people aren't dialed in to do that. Well, you're right. That, I talk about that a lot because the information could be out there. Most people just have the wrong information, but so many people can have the right information and then they just won't do it because our modern society is just set up to work against the, the proper diet and lifestyle. It's hard. It's hard for even me sometimes because it's so backwards. Everything is just working against you. But you mm -hmm. had you know, the tests in front of you, you had your own mortality in front of you. Mm -hmm. So you made the changes. So hopefully people listening will make these changes. So still some more questions before we get into all that diet and lifestyle. There's so many things we need to get into. I want to know how many hours you spent reading. Uh, since Turkey Day in 2002 to now, well over 16,000 hours. So yeah, you were, I know you just went in hard. You went in, you just were doing mm -hmm. this nonstop for days and days. Hard at six hours a day. Sometimes I would start, at the time I had kids and I made sure that I wouldn't, I never really told them what I was up against. I was just a little focused and they'd roll their eyes. There's dad being focused again. And uh, basically after they go to bed, I start reading, say about 10 o'clock at night and I read till two, three, four o'clock in the morning every day. And I was working at a paper company at the time. The CEO felt felt for me and he said, get your work done during the day and you can read all you want. And so he did. And many times I would find myself, say, when the kids were on a, a mini vacation with their mother and all that stuff, uh, I would start reading, say, at six o'clock on Friday evening and go till the sun comes up. Constantly reading, reading, making copies of what I found, making notes, reading, rereading, and on and on and on and on and on. And I still do that today. It's about anywhere from two, two to four hours a day. I read my PubMed stuff. And then I'm constantly searching other medical sites throughout the world uh, to find out what, what are they finding, say, in India or, or Japan or Australia. Because I always assume I don't know enough. Mm -hmm. And I, I am morally obligated to, like I told Bill Davis, I want to find out what works, what doesn't work. So in case I die, I can leave a legacy where somebody can pick up where I left off. Yeah. So that's great. Now the quantity I was wondering is the money you've spent. I don't know if you track this because it seems like you, I, I don't know if I've heard of someone spending more time and money tracking their health using all the tests over the years. Do you have an idea of the quantity or, you know, how many tests you've done and all that? Oh, good Lord. <laughs> well, I would say on the CAT scans alone, somewhere around $25,000 uh, on all the blood work. Oh, good God. Price have gone up, but anywhere between three and $5,000 four times a year. So you're tracking. So, yeah. You're, mm -hmm. you're, I don't know if anyone, I, I've interviewed a lot of people that track, but I don't think anyone's done as much tracking as you have for this long. Well, and, I, and I've done that because as you and I both know, the convention that we're dealing with doesn't track stuff. It's just kind of, they wing it. So I'm an N of one. So I have to treat myself as an N of one. So I, as Bill Davis used to call me, he's my walking, talking lab rat. Well, I, I got it. Somebody's got to do it because nobody else is doing it. So it might as well be me. Well, that's great. So what, maybe we should start with cholesterol. Okay. I had Malcolm Kendrick on. I don't know if you're familiar with him. Yes, but I he am. Had, so he has his idea of how heart disease works. He calls it the mm -hmm. thrombogenic hypothesis. I want to know mm -hmm. if you have a hypothesis that's like sort of this unifying theory. And I don't know where to start, but we need to talk about cholesterol and why maybe LDL is not uh, the, the boogeyman. And well, a whole host of things. So, okay. Uh, I sent you uh, a, a couple of PowerPoints, and one PowerPoint has a bunch of trucks on it. Yep. And uh, they're milk trucks. Uh, lipids are fats, and they carry your stuff all over your body. Okay. So, 
and I'm going to put this, sorry, I'm going to put this on the YouTube version of the interview and I'll, I'll splice mm -hmm. in these diagrams. So just make sure to okay. catch it on my food lies YouTube. Great. Uh, because when you start explaining this, things can get really, I don't want to say lost in the weeds, but there's a lot of tentacles to this uh, octopus. Mm -hmm. So first of all, your body needs LDL, HDL, VLDL, and triglycerides. Your body needs that. Your body makes oh, all of it. They're not just going to kill you. <laughs> so LDL they're is not just there kill to kill you. Right. right. Uh, and, and again, think about phrases like familial hypercholesteremia. Well, mm -hmm. if you're diagnosed with that when you're 50 years old, spoiler alert, you had it since you were born. Okay. So if it's going to kill you, you should have been dead. Just say, to be speaking as an engineer, so apparently that's probably not the problem. So what else changed, you know? Uh, so if you, uh, I, I explain this to people this way. If I took all the LDL out of your body right now, you'd be dead in probably an hour. Mm -hmm. Because all of your hormones are made from LDL. Uh, the driving hormone for it, for that is called pregnenolone and pregnenolone is made from LDL and all the other hormones in your body are made from pregnenolone. That's called a grandmother hormone. So using simple logic, if you reduce your LDL, that means if you reduce it low enough, you will induce a hormonal deficiency, which can induce cancer. And this is in the literature. It will also induce, if you get it low enough, and again, it, everybody's different. If you get it low enough, you will induce, L, what's it called? LDL deficient dementia. Wow, I had that happen to me. That was scary. I, got, I drove my LDL down to 37. Boy, that was a serious case of dumb. But I learned. So LDL is critical. So... If you look at the literature with regards to Alzheimer's, the, there is a trend that shows if you're on a statin, and again, some people need to be on statins, uh, typically the APOE4 types, and that's a whole different sub-discussion. Some people need them. Well, if you don't have enough LDL carrying your vitamin K1, okay, you have a reasonable chance of not having myelination occur inside your brain, which is Dr. Ferland's work out of Canada. It's kind of like, wow. So you need your LDL. LDL carries your vitamin Ks, your vitamin E, and your CoQ10. Okay, so that's that. The proper range per the literature is between 110 and 175. Okay. Below 110, watch out. Just, just, just heads up for your own body, body's sake. Now, the body has all sorts of alternative pathways that work. Okay, I get that. But it's at the cost of longevity. The argument like with vitamin D was, well, people lived a long life with low vitamin D. Well, yeah, how much longer could they have lived if they had vitamin D? You know, it's, it's, it's kind of, you can't prove a negative. But again, your body's got alternative pathways and it's designed for that. But you don't, you know, think about it this way. You can run your car with virtually no air in your tires and you won't have much tire life, but you can still run your car. It's always good to put the right amount of air in your tires, you know, yeah. just saying. Uh, so now HDL that also carries K's on it. And it's also critical in a whole host of other things in your body, specifically what I call reverse calcium transport. Okay, and then you've got your VLDLs carrying the stuff around because your body loves K. It just does. And according to studies and Sugars, Vermeers, Booth, the whole bunch of experts in sheer earth, they've all said you can't take too much K within reason. And Sato says the same thing. Uh, in Japan, he will give people right around 45 to 50 milligrams of MK4 every day for osteoporosis along with magnesium and D. And no big deal. And of course, being the plucky lab rat that I am, I tried 75 of that, and one and a half milligrams of, I don't know, MK7 and what was it, 15 milligrams of K1. Did that for a year. And guess what? This N of 1 was fine. Mm -hmm. uh, so what the heck? 
But yeah, that's so the actual range for LDL. So the whole history behind the statin thing, and again, some people need it. I'm not going to argue against that part. It was based on the Framingham Heart Study. And the Framingham Heart Study showed that if the entire population of the Framingham Heart Study was taken into consideration, there is no correlation between LDL and heart disease. That's a fact. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? They cherry-picked the Framingham Heart Disease data, which is, again, a fact. And they left out premenopausal women. At that point, LDL made a difference. Okay? So, they went off misinformation, which you and I would say that's that's kind of bogus. Mm -hmm. So that's how all this started. So they said, ah, oh, there's a correlation between LDL and heart disease, and we've got a pill for that. Okay. Well, uh, your, your, your statistics was wrong. So being a stats guy, I kind of went, oh, good Lord. What the? Well, there was an agenda there. So that's, that's where that ultimately came from. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but like I said, some people need it, but not everybody. I remember what were they talking about four or five years ago, putting statin in the drinking water. Are you crazy? It's insane. I mean, what the heck are you people thinking? So that's, that's that on LDL, uh, HDL, you, you should have it over 40. Uh, ideally I, I, I inform people that a good rule of thumb, just a rule of thumb is keep your LDL at the same level as a number, not as in the actual uh, U.S. system. If you're, let's say your vitamin D is 60 nanograms per milliliter, earlier, get your HDL about 60. If your V D is at 80, get your HDL around 80, but get it all over 60 and, and you're, you're in good shape. Uh, drive down your triglycerides. Uh, Bill Davis's work and other people's work is your trigs are really a measure of how much junk food you eat. Yeah. Drive those down. Uh, you should have your trigs below 110. Uh, Basically, and, uh, get the triglyceride to HDL ratio around one. Yeah. There you get go. Get that that's down. A, I mean, if you had your trigs down at 80. Yeah. If you have your trigs down at 80, your HDL up at 80. I mean, that's where oh I am. God. I'm pretty close to there. I, I don't really. I need to do it again. But yes. Right. You're rocking it. You really are. Yeah, and 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 the first thing I hear from people to do that one point zero or say even one point two or you know or not two to one, good lord, uh, is well I like my pizza. Oh okay, make it out of cauliflower. Well that takes a lot of work. Well again rationalizing a certain behavior. Well you don't want to rationalize being on a crash cart. So you yeah. know. Mm. All right, so we got HDL, LDL. So okay, what 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 is your your hydra? What what is all the heart disease? Well, um, let, let's go back to what you were talking about, Kendrick and, and thrombosis theory. Okay. Well, being a geek, uh, this is one of the slides that I sent you. I'm going to read from it right now, and I've it's titled "The Apparent Sequence or Race to Butt Out the Fire of CAD." Now, this is from the literature, and again, I love connecting dots. It seems to be one of my proclivities since I've been a little kid. First thing that happens is when you get your free T3 correct, you go, that's thyroid, Pat. Yeah, I know. When your free T3 is between 3.5 and 5.0, and now I'll explain to how it got onto this, it activates something called a B, C, A, A, B, C, dash, A, one, and A, B, C, G, G, dash, one. When that's upregulator activated by free T3, that starts the cascade of events to clean out your pipes. Now, this is going to end up at a fascinating comment about testing, okay? So once, once in the free T3 is all happy, the D is riding on its own carrier protein. D does not ride on LDL or HDL. Then it gets activated. When D gets activated, upregulates. Okay, folks, it's called uncarboxylated osteocalcin. Oh, God, MGP. There's Pat talking big words. Ah, I didn't create that word. It's just his. Just call it MGP. And MGP is further implicated in microclots and COVID. We can talk about that later. And 
that MGP is on the macrophage or foam cell surface. Now, as I dr drill down into this, heart disease, in addition, is a surface chemistry problem. So we can get into that later if we want to talk about soap. Mm -hmm. uh, now, when that surface gets activated, matrix clot proteins, guess what's activated? Beta HDL. Well, I thought it's HDL. No, 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 no. The liver makes beta HDL to go out there and look for foam cells or macrophages. It connects, connects to the, say, foam cell, and it's anchored there using CoQ10. Isn't that something? Now, there's one of those my, my, my moments. So that's the Velcro that holds it there. And what does the beta HDL do? It sucks the foam out of the foam cell. That's pretty cool, really. It's kind of like a mosquito. <laughs> so when the foam cell is has its content somewhat sucked out by the beta HDL, the beta HDL sends a signal to the A APOA-1. Now you got to remember all these freaking terms. Mm -hmm. Well, we've all heard about the APOA1 dash or to the APO a, uh, B100 ratio and how important that is. Well, if you have a lot of APOA1 that connects to the beta HDL that's now full of foam, and it creates HDL. And that HDL then goes back to your liver for reprocessing. Now, isn't that cool? You see, this is a sequence. Is this a sequence of events that all has to, this cascade has to work that way. So now you're sucking the foam out of the foam cell. And uh, so well, that- You should explain beta, the foam cell first. Okay, well, well okay. When, when you have a- Oh, I love this term, an insult to your pipe, mm -hmm. say a viral thing or a bacterial thing or a mold or a fungus or the pipe just freaking cracks. And you go, how does a pipe crack? That's due to a lack of elastin, which is a function of vitamin C and vitamin K, K7, but that's a, we can talk about that later. So the pipe cracks. Well, the macrophages are your repair crew. And you and I both know in the engineering world, you got to have the maintenance tree team. Well, this is the maintenance team. They all rush in there and patch the crack for a good reason. Well, what they're supposed to do is experience apoptosis, another fancy term for they're supposed to die. And well, <laughs> they're just supposed to die. Well, if they don't die, the body says, hey, you don't belong there. <laughs> Your job's done. Would you please leave? And the macrophage basically says, no, we're not going to. And so then the body sends in LDL with K1 attached to attach to the macrophage to induce apoptosis and kill the foam cell, uh, kill the macrophage. And if the macrophage doesn't kill that way because there's not enough K in your LDL, the macrophage literally eats the LDL. And that's how the macrophage gets to be full of fat. That's how they turn into. Foam cells. Foam really means fat. So they look real puffy under the microscope. So again, as an engineer, go, where did the where did the fat come from in a microphage in macrophage? That doesn't make any sense. So, so you research it. Oh, okay. So while this happens, the as it morphs into a foam cell, it starts replicating on its own. It's growing. It's like I call it cancer of the of the arteries. Because now you've got a cell growing that's not supposed to be growing. And it keeps growing and growing and growing and growing. And as it grows, it gives off a chemical. Uh, I don't know how you would describe it. Uh, maybe like acetone. That dissolves the bonding tissues associated with your epithelial layer. And the next thing you know, this little growth of critters pops through. And now you've got uh, a cardiac opportunity. You know, you got a thrombosis. So, okay, that's that's how you get to have a, a trip on a crash cart. So what is supposed to happen is the foam cells are supposed to die. And then they start morphing into bad things. And so if your body has the correct amount of stuff attached to the VLDL, the LDL, and the HDL, you should be able to get out of this. But that's not the whole story. So anyway, when the... MGP gets carboxylated thanks to the MK7. In other words, that has kind of a chemical change of state. I'm just reading this here because this is kind of complicated. 
The MGP sends out a signal. Oh, one other thing. You'll, you'll love this. Uh, one of the things that is carried in the LDL to kill the foam cell is messenger RNA. Mm. My, my, my. Where have we heard of messenger RNA before to kill things? Mm. Hmm. Yeah. My, my, my. And remember a few years ago, they were talking about uh, nanobacteria. Remember that? Mm -hmm. uh, the nanobacteria causing heart disease. And I'll just say a good friend was doing some research on that nanobacteria, got a half million dollar grant or something like that. And I says, uh, it, it's going to be microRNA. Oh, you don't know that? I says, it's in the literature. And guess what? microRNA. And guess what? Nobody's talking about nanobacteria anymore. Uh, my, my, my. So anyway, uh, once the MGPs got carboxylated, that sends a signal to the liver to make more fetoin A. And you're going, what's fetoin A? Well, fetoin A is a carrier protein for calcium. My, oh, my, that my. Was a Star Wars thing. No, I'm just saying. <laughs> uh, so did I. You know, I, I thought it was from the dig of a star system. I, I mean, yeah. you know, my God, you know. And there is feta with B. I says, I, maybe that's that's where the dark side hangs out. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But uh, so feta with A is a carrier protein for calcium. So making sure you have proper magnesium, which chemically loosens up the calcium. There's a, there's a you know, some PCAM going on there. The feta with A comes in there and grabs onto the calcium and takes it either to the liver or to the bone for reprocessing. And that's how your arteries get cleaned out. And this is all in the freaking literature. And uh, the carboxylated MGP allows for the VLDL and LDL to, to kill the foam cells and all that other happy stuff. And uh, that's basically how this thing works. Biochemically, it's fascinating as hell. Now, you've heard of people who have a chelation therapy for heart disease. Okay. Well, chelation therapy is a substitute for having low feto and A levels. Or okay, feto and A is a, an ELISA kit. You can you can get the kit, but nobody tests for it. Why? I have no clue for that. For instance, if you were a type four kidney patient, you know, stage four dial, stage, stage four kidney disease, kidney disease people die from hardening of the arteries. Isn't that something? My my my. And what are kidney disease patients deficient in? Feto and A. Mm -hmm. My, my, my. So yeah. I have been working with a doctor in the Detroit area to see if we can get a standardized to one of the big uh, testing companies to start doing Feto and A testing. And we're going to do some backgrounds on people. And we think we've pretty much validated a whole lot of other science that's out there. And Feto and A is the uh, linchpin on it. So there, that's, that's how this stuff works. That's super interesting because... I'll admit, I didn't know anything about Feto and A until I started listening to you and I, I was looking it up and I, I mean, it's basically how to stop calcification. I, I saw an image of a rat or a mouse. They, they did some snips or they modified the DNA mm -hmm. to, to make it have no Feto, feto and A, whatever right. they knocked it out, right? They knocked out the, the Feto mm -hmm. and A gene and it was just That's covered right. in calcifications that had lesions everywhere. And mm -hmm. Super simple to see. So it's like if you don't have feto and A, you're going to get all the calcifications in your arteries. And that's what the calcium. I just want to make sure everyone's understanding this. We're talking about the calcium score. We started out with the CAC score. That's a calcium score. This is, you know, what occludes the arteries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, it's it, it, you know, again, you wonder what I research. I research stuff like this so that I understand the pathway because it's just how I am. If I don't understand the system, I can't speak with authority. So, okay. So let's make it easier for people to understand because we got into some weeds there. Maybe we could just mm -hmm. zoom out to just the diet and lifestyle part because we kind of skipped okay. over that. I know people are super curious about that because you mentioned, oh, you're eating sauerkraut and stuff like that. What? <laughs> Maybe skip ahead and then we'll work back. Like what sure. do you think sure. is the diet and lifestyle that will get you to not have the problems? Uh, first of all, it's don't eat junk fat. And you go, what's junk fat? Well, anything other than coconut oil, butter, uh, macadamia nut oil, almond oil, and 
olive oil, fish oil is okay for you. Uh, avocado oil, eh, I don't know. But that's everything else will kill you. And now you say, why does it kill you? Real simple. It changes the diameter of your LDL and HDL particles. Well, why is that a problem? Well, imagine you have two LDL particles. One's the size of a golf ball and one's the size of a beach ball. How much more stuff can you hook to a beach ball versus a golf ball? A whole lot, because you're dealing with surface area. And henceforth, you're dealing with that phrase I said earlier, surface chemistry. So, so make you want sure... The oils. You don't want the seed oils. The Oh, God, no. Oh, no God. seed the, oils. The, yeah. Okay, so then... And it, no, it's interesting because you said you kind of accidentally did this diet without knowing it. And it was, you had your sauerkraut, you had sausage, you had, you know, all this is vitamin K re rich diet that you later realize why it worked. And, and it's funny because, I mean, that's what I eat a lot. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. eating the sauerkraut, the sausage, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Turns out sausage is full of vitamin Ks. And if you can find a, an old world butcher shop in your neighborhood, where they hang the sausage and age it for a month or so, that sausage is just riddled with K, just riddled with it. Aged uh, cheeses back, have a lot of K too. Cheeses have K, egg yolks have K, uh, sauerkraut has K. Uh, if you want to eat kimchi, God love you. Uh, uh, same with natto. It all has K. Natto, but more important. I'm no, sorry, to say, jump in. I, I love kimchi. I grew up in Hawaii. Uh, I'll eat kimchi wow. all day, but I tried natto in Hawaii and it was disgusting. Right. A again, it's an acquired taste. It's like, like drinking scotch. It's an acquired taste. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so what? now let's get into a, a, a real simple, not lost in the weeds. People need to understand how this works. Now, no. you've got gut bacteria. They're anaerobic bacteria, meaning they don't like air. Uh, I've got a background in anaerobic bacteria and I can talk about that for hours, but Anyway, your bacteria talk to your body and your body talks to your bacteria. So the body sends signals to your gut bacteria of what chemicals they need liberated from the food that you're eating. So in the world of chemistry, you need what's called precursors. Okay. So what you need for your K is if you, let's just say, eat some broccoli. Keep it simple. You, and that gives you your K1. Your gut bacteria uh, take that K1 and they rejigger it into various MKs and put the MKs on chylomicrons and the chylomicrons go to your liver. And then your liver does what it, whatever it wants to do. There you go. It's pretty much that simple. So if now you say, well, what happens if you don't have broccoli? Well, and if you don't have sauerkraut? Well, if you eat things that have phenolic rings, now you go, oh my God, he's getting in the weeds. Imagine uh, a ring structure. Uh, two ring structures joined together, which you typically find in, say, the skins of cherries or the skins of apples and stuff like that. The gut bacteria are smart enough to grab those ring structures and rejigger it less efficiently, but into the case that the body's demanding. And that's really where all this starts. No, what about K fours? What about MK4? like from the animal foods okay. and you know stuff like that? Yeah, it all is done in your gut if they have the correct amount of precursors. It's all done in the gut. And uh, now there's something even really crazier going on, is when your body makes some MK four, it goes part of that goes into the lymph system, and this is early research on that. And the tail is completely cut off from, from the MK4, and the body converts that into, MK, into K3, or metadione. And you go, huh? What's that going to do? Well, it turns out metadione is a water-soluble form of K. It's not really K, but they call it K. And that goes into, and it immediately passes your blood-brain barrier and is immediately made into MK4 in your brain. No, ain't that cool? That's pretty wild. The fallback position on that is the K1 that you have in your diet 
Part of the tail is clipped off in the liver. It's attached to your LDL. It goes to your blood-brain barrier, and that truncated LDL go, is pulled through, and then the brain rejiggers that into MK4 as a backup. Now, and that's something. Just neat. Mm. But yeah, it's your gut bacteria making this stuff based on what your body tells you it needs. For instance, let's say calcium. You don't take exogenous calcium, or I tell people, don't chew on limestone. Don't do that. Your body's not designed for that. Mm -hmm. So what your body says is if I need calcium, it will send a signal to your gut bacteria to liberate calcium. If you don't need calcium, it's not liberated. Now, if you give yourself the fancy term as exogenous calcium, you're chewing some limestone, the body sees that calcium rush and it goes, oh my God, what do we are supposed to do with this? So the phetto A panics and it grabs onto the stuff and it starts putting it in places where it doesn't belong, like your joints, as an example, and your pipes and other places. And that's it. And now people don't gr grasp this, but your pH of your blood is regulated with calcium. And when you take calcium, it changes the buffering characters. Now this is geeky science. Your blood ain't happy. So your body makes darn sure your blood's happy because your pH is running a real tight range. And so it says, we got to do something with this. And it's typically, uh, they put it in place where it doesn't belong. So that's, mm. that's that pretty cool. Just... Yeah. So a lot of disease, uh, there's you're kind of revolving around these three vitamins and they, they're these fat soluble vitamins and magnesium. But it's kind of like mm -hmm. a, a balance of vitamin K, vitamin D and magnesium. A lot of things. I mean, multiple guests have talked about this stuff before, and it's I'm just remembering all the different guests I've had. And it's all revolving around the vitamin K, the D and the magnesium. Well, that's that's where you. I call it, that's putting air in the tires. You start there mm -hmm. and then you dial your body in from there with your diet. Mm -hmm. For instance, if you work out very hard, you need a high amount of uh, uh, semi-essential amino acids such as citrulline uh, as an example and lysine. Lysine is a great antiviral. Your body needs that. You also need your vitamin C. You got to have that or... You know, a lot of that cell induced cell death doesn't happen. You got to have a sufficient C because if you don't have sufficient C, a whole another set of things go in the wrong direction, like your elastin manufacturing in all your pipes and in your lungs. It just doesn't happen or if, as efficiently. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, that's a diet thing for the most part for starters. Now, animals make pretty much their own vitamin C. Uh, do you need to be at the same vitamin C as a primate? Uh, probably not, but mm -hmm. you need your vitamin C and it's somewhere between six and 16 grams of vitamin C a day, typically in divided doses, typically. And that creates a whole nother network of things that happen for the, for the good of your body. Uh, but again, it's, it's diet related. Uh, when you eat uh, blueberries and raspberries and stuff like that, that's where those Mm -hmm. chain the, those ring structures are that your gut bacteria are really happy making stuff out of. Uh, Dr. Tim Noak says you should only eat once a day, which mm -hmm. I do. And I fully agree with him because his logic is staggeringly simple because that's what the body's really designed for. Why? You think about this. If you and, and take a, 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 let's say you wolf down a Big Mac. <laughs> and you mm -hmm. get with the pun. <laughs> so that hits your intestine and your gut bacteria go, ah, what do we got here? And your body says, hey, I need this, 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 and this from that food that you that that the mouth just sucked in. And the gut bacteria says, Well, okay, <laughs> hold my beer, I got this. Mm -hmm. So so the gut bacteria dutifully start uh rejiggering their own genetic expressions to make the stuff that the body's demanding. So when you discharge your stool, somewhere between 25 and 40% of that stool is bacteria. And that's mm -hmm. amazing. And your bacteria, your gut bacteria has between what, 400 and 4,000 different species or something like that, some bizarre number. And so it's all there for a reason. And each species has its own genetic code, which is unique to that species and unique to what you inherited from your mother. Well, my, my, my. So if you eat that big Big Mac, and let's say two hours later you follow it with, uh, oh, uh, an impersonal sized pizza, you suck that down. Now <laughs> you got mm -hmm. that coming through your pipes. Now you got one set of bacteria doing their thing, and they're replicating this way, and they go, "What's this?" 
where'd this come from? So they attempt to try to do the same thing, but now they have to change your species again. Now you got the gut bacteria in the body really confused. And so then this goes on for, you know, four or six hours. And then let's say you go to a, I don't know, uh, 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 a movie and you suck down some uh, cheesy fries and a bag of popcorn and some Coca-Cola. Well, <laughs> they're going, oh, what do we do with this? Pretty soon the body gets really confused and henceforth mm-hmm. you don't get the stuff liberated the way you're supposed to. So when you eat once a day, it gives the time for your body to react for that bolus to go through that entire pipe structure so you get what you need. And, and, and that's the funnest way I can explain just doing it right. So, well, yeah, and, I think it's a great option. OMAD is great. I like two meals a day. I think mm-hmm. unless you're if unless you're a bodybuilder or a pregnant woman or a child or teen, I don't know why you need to eat more than two meals a day. I mean, those people can eat three meals a day. Whatever. I, I don't like to make like specific recommendations anyway. It's like I, I just right. I've seen a lot of success from OMAD in yeah, I posted a picture of my friend. He lost like 80 pounds uh, mm-hmm. recently just doing OMAD. And yeah, and, and Noakes is great. Dr. Noakes was on the show, uh, one of the first four episodes, maybe episode three. And mm-hmm. a lot of great stuff there, especially with athletics. Maybe you could talk about, um, man, I don't want to jump all around, but I know you you train Jeremy Scott, a pole vaulter. We talked about our love of pole vaulting and uh, just get into this this mm-hmm. story of carbs and athletics real quick. Uh, I read Noakes' book, Law of Running, back in 2001. And this is before I had any of my heart disease issues. Read the whole book cover to cover, about 900 pages. And uh, I consider him the guru of distance training. And I got to the chapter on carbs. I read it and I went, well, you got everything else right. <laughs> <laughs> Well, hats off to Noakes, and it shows the quality of man that he is. He flat out said a couple of years ago, uh, read Law of Running, but ignore the portion on carbs. In fact, tear it out of the book. It's wrong. And uh, the issue with carbs and training is it's, it's just gross misinformation. It's based not on sound science, for starters. And your body runs best on ketones. Uh, your body uh, and that's that's it carbs carbs will kill you and so uh even if you're a high-end athlete you want to replace your carbs with fat now in jeremy scott's case his wife had celiacs quite badly so to be a good supportive husband he decided to go on a celiac type diet which is basically carb free and uh, he was terrified he would lose his edge and i said no you will be better and he turned out to be better. Absolutely true. Absolutely true. It hats off to Jeremy and, and a, another, all sorts of the other high school and college athletes and grade school athletes they worked with. They just love running on fat. Their body just runs very efficiently there. So um, he, Jeremy Scott is a 2012 Olympic pole vaulter. And you also right. train, you were your, his, his sort of speed and nutrition coach or something. Speed and nutrition you coach. You do that yeah. with other people as well. You train. you right. Uh, let's see. Uh, who who else did people could fact check me on? I love this. <laughs> uh, 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 duh, duh. Uh, it's okay. We, we don't necessarily uh, need. I'll, if you think of it later, but I'll, I'll, the name will come to me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Sasha Kovalev, he, the two four hundred meter hurdle champions in Russia. I worked with both of them. Mm. Sasha and uh, Vera Vera Rudakova. That's the lady. Well, that's interesting. There, that that's a pretty glycolytic event to do without carbs right well you don't it, it, carbs carbs don't help you run efficiently and that that's what's your mitochondria run best when you're running on mk7 and um, uh coq10 because it's interesting the, yeah no I, I i was against carbs for quite a while and i i did a pentathlon i was trying to do decathlon because pole vaults included mm-hmm. and i couldn't find mm-hmm. one that year but mm-hmm. i did a pentathlon i didn't even eat that day <laughs> i mm-hmm. just did the whole thing fasted and and got second place in the the north american europe uh central american and caribbean championships for cool. 
Yeah. yeah. But anyway, I just did as a goof, just fasted and running on fat. But, you know, I actually mm-hmm. have added more carbs back in strategically of whole foods. We're talking about like fruit and, uh, you know, some strategic whole food carbs. Right. So I don't, I, I wouldn't I, say right. carbs right. would kill you. I'm I just not- want to push back on the carbs would kill you because I, I kind of like went through that phase and now I'm sort of out of that because, but I think 90% of the world's carbs might kill them because they're eating processed carbs and they're overweight. That's, I should have clarified. Junk carbs will kill you. Yeah. Uh, the, as Noakes puts it, your diet should be 30% fat, 30%, 20, 60% fat, 30% protein, and 10% complex carbs like raspberries, blueberries, you know, that's good for you. It's fast, fasting. Don't eat the bun of a Big Mac. Yeah, that's, that's not, not that's not a good quality carb. And you know, I'll give you another good one for training. You've, you've seen these various sports drinks that are on the sidelines. Well, when you drink a sports drink and you're competing, your brain sees the sugar. The first thing it does, it spikes your insulin. When it spikes your insulin, it shuts down the muscle groups that you're using in the sport that you're in. So why do you want to shut down the muscle groups you're using? That makes no sense. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah. Well, and so many problems developed, like Tim Noakes became pre-diabetic, basically being a lean athlete and doing... Yeah, I'm just over. I'm just not into the the long distance running. <laughs> I think it's overstressing your body, and it's not really necessary. I like, <laughs> I like to sprint. I sprint or walk. I think sprinting or walking is good. And uh, I fully agree with you. A 50 mile road race? Are you nuts? I won't even build oh, a bike that far. That's for but the here birds. he is, 62 years old, lean as lean could be, a 50 mile runner, and he gets the diabetes. Holy uh, tamale, man! It's a good warning. I mean, that's that's what happens when you, you you're guzzling all those processed carbs. You're doing the little packets of the goo. It, it's just not. Yeah. And so many people they're they're like, yeah, but I'm an athlete. I eat carb. I'm like, yeah, you, you can do okay for a certain amount of time. But if you're if you're just overdoing it, your your system's not really made for that. Which kind of brings me to the point of this general diet stuff we're talking about is is basically mm-hmm. an ancestral diet. Like, what did we have available for most of human history? We had animal foods. We had a few, you know, plant like herbs and little things around. And we had fruit, stuff like that. That mm-hmm. That's what you're talking about. We're getting all the things we need. And then humans did develop ways to ferment things. And, you know, we always mm-hmm. had these different methods of preparing foods that helped g- get more nutrients and create make them more bioavailable. But yeah, the simple answer that I always go back to and what what sapien is i just call it sapien it's like well what do homo sapiens need we need the uh-huh. sun we need to sleep we need some sort of movement and we need an ancestral diet of you know what we talked about just animal foods and we don't need to eat all the time right that goes back to two meals a day i don't think it was really possible to eat that more than that or i think that's just what the human body's meant for one to two meals a day because uh-huh. if I, I fill myself up Twice. I fill myself up to reasonable amount. I wait seven hours, then I fill myself up to reasonable amount. That's 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 it. Like, why would I need more than that? Right. You've dialed your body in, which is so critical. You have you have embraced a lifestyle of owning your performance, and that's fantastic. That just is fantastic. That's that's how you're supposed to do this. Well, yeah. So let's. We don't have too much more time here, but. I want to just talk about your Hydra, your your heart disease, the dragon with the many heads, and just kind of wrap all these things together we talked about. And also make sure to go back. You did talk about the gut bacteria and stuff like right, that right. and the microbiome because that's so huge that heart disease that you, you figured that out, you know, 20 years ago, 19 years yep. ago. Yep. Uh, 20, 20, this, 20 this November. <laughs> yeah. Uh uh, I'm doing fine. Uh, the way I train, uh, you might as well know how I do that. Uh, again, in my travels, uh, you shouldn't work out more than an hour a day. If you want to do a cardiovascular sport, which basically most all sports are, you ramp your heart rate up from, say, 60% of theoretical max, you know, not even mm-hmm. a brisk walk. And then if you're just starting to train the last five, well, it's really the last five seconds. Let's say the last five minutes, you've now ramped up to 95% of your theoretical maximum. And then you push it to your maximum for 
in five second increments. And uh, you are then be then your body will allow you to hold your heart rate at exceptionally high levels. And uh, uh, one of the things that sticks in my mind is when I was 58 years old, I could hold my heart rate at 185 beats a minute for two hours. Well, well, I was running a 155, 800 at age 58. Oh man, that's good. Yeah. Uh, I, I ran into Lance Armstrong's training facilities or training schedule from the literature. I, he could hold his heart rate at something like, then this could be fake news. What I read, I don't know. It, it, I think it was mm-hmm. the real thing, but whatever. Uh, 215 beats a minute for, uh, four hours. Mm. And that's okay. when he was, because steroids or hormones, exogenous hormones don't have your heart do that. And you can't have this kind of cardiac output unless your brain accepts higher and higher heart rates over longer and longer periods of time. What I learned from the Mayo Clinic is the professional athlete that has the highest VO2 max are ice hockey players. And you kind of go, how is that happening? It's how they practice. If you ever get a chance, and I really want you to do this, go to an NHL practice and just watch what they do at the start of season for the just just take notes on what they do in the entire practice and watch what they do at the very end of practice which is the same thing they do this it's called heart rate recruitment uh high end swimmers do the same thing high end runners don't do that but high end swimmers do high end bikers do it high end hockey players do it but runners don't um uh, i had a chance to spend uh some time with uh he was the US swim team coach in 1980 that never went to the Olympics. And we talked about heart rate recruitment in swimmers. And he said, mm-hmm. it's absolutely critical. That swimmer that can hold his heart rate at the high end for the longer and longer periods of time will always win. Or as my Russian friend said, if the pump don't pump, you don't go. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's, a, you know, mm-hmm. so what happens is when you, when you push yourself like that, you need to make sure that you take citrulline three to six grams a day. Citrulline helps you remodel your pipes. Pretty cool because mm. your pipes get stressed like everything else and it needs repair materials to fix them. And citrulline does that. Uh, you don't take arginine. Arginine is not liked by the body. The liver will make the arginine it needs based on the arginine demands, assuming it has available citrulline. So that's another little piece of trivia. Mm. And you were a hockey goalie. I... Yes. Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was accused of being a goalie. <laughs> I, I still got scored on. For you folks out here that are watching this, uh, back in the late 60s, that's how old I am, my goals against average was 0.93. So for wow. you hockey jocks out there, I know what you're going to say. Oh, my God. Uh, my, uh, well, my brother Eddie got his tryout with the Red Wings. My brother Joe got his tryout with the Yankees. I got drafted, apparently. I, I don't get into all this stuff, but you know, people are like, oh, well, this happened. Oh, yeah. that's cool. By the supposedly by the Maple Leafs, but I, I was pretty decent at what I did. Uh, but I, I ran track and I swam and I played football just to stay in really, really tip top shape. Because back then, if you wanted to get your full ride, which I got to Lake Superior State, you had to be not better than the Canadians. You had to be way better. You had to give that coach a reason to put you on the team versus a Canadian. Mm. So uh, for you folks out there that like to run track, my senior year of high school, I ran a 152.8 in the 800. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's good. Clipping along. That's good. I couldn't quite stuff a basketball, but I could high jump six foot. And, uh, you know, I and I also got an academic full ride. So, it, you know, I had the bronze to go with the brains. I so, love it. Anyway. I yeah, love it. I, yeah. Just, no, you're doing it. Um, Okay, but so we we brought in this stuff to kind of wrap things up. Can you do maybe assume people are looking at the Hydra and kind of wrap up how if someone had, well, for one, we should suggest people get a CAC score. It's not expensive. You can do it. And then secondly, what can they do about it if they have a high score? which is what I mean with wrapping up the Hydra. There's all these things that can cause heart disease mm-hmm. and well, any kind of chronic disease really. And what mm-hmm. can you, what are those things? And then how do you combat them? 
Okay, first of all, it starts with your attitude. And like I tell people, rule number one, don't panic. Just take you, you if you're getting a CAC score, that means you're taking ownership in your health. That's 99% of the solution. Be happy. Now you're only dealing with 1% of the issue, which is okay. Everybody can handle that. Be methodic. Don't panic. You, you've got this. Be, you've got more people on the web right now that can at least get you going in the right direction than what I had in 2002. So do your testing. Do your baseline stuff. You know, check check the tire pressure before you go on your trip. Do that first. And that tire pressure is uh, vitamin D, CoQ10, red blood cell magnesium, free T3. Uh, your APOE status, are you 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4, 4, 2, 4, 3, whatever, because that makes somewhat of a difference in how you approach the problem. The good news is with your APOE status, and you send it in for further analysis, it can tell you some of your subtle genetic speed bumps, which I have some B metabolism issues that I never knew. I suspected, but I never knew. Again, forewarned. It's forearmed. Okay. And then just methodically just uh, go after it. Just, you just, just simply don't panic and you'll be fine. And get a C, uh, get a score, say once a year, once a year and a half. Uh, you don't need to go crazy. Don't need to panic and you'll be okay. But uh, as you find yourself safe, vitamin D deficient, get your vitamin D up. Mm-hmm. That takes three to six months to get it to where it needs to be. If you're 10 deficient, take your ubiquinol. If you're red blood cell magnesium deficient, which even the NIH even says we're deficient in, get that Mm -hmm. up there. So you take about a half a gram to a gram a day of magnesium. I take a gram a day. Okay. That's from my body. Mm -hmm. Okay. uh, I I take uh, armor thyroid because my, when I got that jab, my thyroid got shut off. Mm. And it hasn't really rebounded, which isn't cool. But that, so that's, I have to do that. That just is what it is. So I don't get all nerved up over it. And uh, don't eat junk sugars, you know, eat good carbs, uh, manage your diet correctly and own your health because psychologically you will feel so much better that you are in control. And that's so important. Well, and it's you, so you, important. I just started talking about this recently because it's like your perception, how you identify, how you think of yourself as I am a healthy person, I am taking control of my health. That is 99% of it because that helps make Mm -hmm. all your decisions thereafter. If Mm -hmm. if I say this is me, I'm healthy and I am. And that's because I do this daily and I'm like, I go out in the sun and I read and I don't eat added sugar, refined grains or seed oils. You know, like mm-hmm. I, these are all the things I do because I'm healthy. And also, yeah, I don't stress out. I like that, too. That's Malcolm Kendrick stuff, too, about how much stress actually influences your body and and heart mm-hmm. disease. It, it is a there is a physical manifestation of stress and it's real right. and you can't do that. Yeah. The so, cortisol negatively impacts your elastin. They're absolutely correct. So basically. Don't eat the junk food. That's the the big three: the seed oils, <laughs> the refined <laughs> grains, the yeah, the added sugar. If you avoid that, you're you're mostly way there with the diet. Maybe eat fewer times per day, right? right. Eat in a smaller window. Mm-hmm. Uh, eat ancestrally. Yeah, eat right. the whole foods. Okay, yeah, some of this. So, the last thing we'll say is that the vitamin stuff, vitamin K, you're really into the K and I know you have a whole uh, website about it. What is it called again? K dash. It's K dash vitamins.com. Uh-huh. And that website is dedicated to the peer reviewed literature of vitamin K. There is, there's two things in there. One's the cardiac manifesto and my story, which are both uh, copyrighted. And if you want to call that salesmanship, it's not, mm-hmm. it's just is what it is. There is no salesmanship there. None. Mm-hmm. It's just the literature mm-hmm. because somebody has to have a go-to site for the literature associated with K without any embellishment. So, which I think is pretty cool. And I was going to say is I think I'm not into supplementation in general, but I think it's super necessary for a lot of people because I think it's, you just have to get back up to baseline or get yourself out of the mess or the modern world has kind of put a lot of people in a mess. So I used to be like more against it, but then I realized that it is necessary in our modern world if you and to test and to do it 
specifically. And then maybe if you get your levels correct, maybe and you're healthy, you can just rely on whole foods. I'd rather just do it through diet. But that's, I think maybe, that's the correct way to do it. Absolutely. Fully yeah. Agree. Correct. And now I got one last story on, on diet. It had to do with the Inuit. Uh, Denmark owns Greenland. So Denmark decided to bring some Inuit to Copenhagen. And again, this is a peer reviewed study of why do the Inuit diet Copenhagen? Mm -hmm. So they went from an Inuit diet, and this just happened about 15, 20 years ago. They went to Copenhagen, they went on a Western diet, and I forgot how fast so many of them just had heart disease, they had strokes, they died. Finally, the Inuit, according to the study, said, we're not going to Copenhagen because there's something there that's killing us. And so the Danish government said, well, well we kind of doubt that. So they basically studied what the Inuit ate. And the Inuit did not eat what the people in Copenhagen ate. Henceforth, the gut bacteria of the Inuit was not designed for a Western junk food diet. Henceforth, they didn't liberate the chemistry that they needed. There you go. And it happened quickly. Yes, real quick. Real That's quick. what happens when, when you, populations are not used to the Western diet. Uh, it happened with the Pima Indians, all kinds of American Indians. Mm -hmm. It happened with the Aboriginals in Australia. It happens everywhere in the world when they're mm -hmm. brought into this highly refined industrial diet quickly. Right. Type 2 right. diabetes, obesity, heart well, disease, everything. Yep, you're so right. You're so right. And it's so simple just to get back to the basics. Would I like to get away from all these vitamins I take? Absolutely. I just I just want to eat a nice meal every day. But catch everything's been... Yeah, yeah, exactly. The message out there yeah. is catch it early before the, the problems occur. Because So many people, man, I'm on social media. So you see all these, the people that go vegan, they're 22, they're already thin, you know, and then they can do anything. But then they suffer the consequences later. And you always hear the stories. And I, and I, I even deal with some of them with Dr. Gary, who I work with. And, you know, they, mm -hmm. get, they get ruined from these plant-based diets or just insufficient, you know, vitamins and minerals and all that. Our gut bacteria, which is really from your mother and your grandmother and great-grandmother and all that stuff, our, our body and our gut bacteria is designed to be an omnivore. We're just designed for that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Noakes' research has pretty much validated that. We're, we're an omnivore. And we are designed to eat once or twice a day, fully agree. And again, for your body, twice a day is fine. Now, mm -hmm. when I really start working out hard, getting ready for the Masters Championships and stuff, I'm, I'm, I'm consuming close to 6,000 calories a day, twice a day. But I know exactly what I'm eating, why I'm eating it, and when I'm eating it. So I get the results that I need. But when I'm not really pushing the envelope mm -hmm. I eat once a day because that's all I need. Yep. Yeah. That's, that's big. Okay. Well, we could go on forever. Probably. I, I don't know if this is going to help or not, but I wanted to list out all the things on your Hydra drawing sure. because mm -hmm. there's so many things that, that factor in and we kind of covered all of them, but you have low mm -hmm. K Bedouin A out of range, APOE status, low D, CoQ10, low free T3, low magnesium. So these are a lot of things you can test for. But then the other problems, you can have trace metals, junk food diet, mechanical problems even, LDL, HL, surface chemistry, insulin, glucose, exogenous chemistry like smoking, taking things, right? Substances, smoking, statins, warfarin, calcium, phosphorus, autoimmune issues, hormones, gut bacteria, amino acids, low vitamin C, invasive critters. So yeah. that's kind of, I mean, if you, uh, I don't know if that's too much to wrap up, but I mean, it's, if you dial in your diet and lifestyle, a lot of those can be dialed in. Absolutely. If virtually every one of those, let's say you're 40 years old or if even 50, let's say you got a clean calcium score at 50 or even age 60, get your diet right. Then you never have to worry. Start yeah. there. You are what you eat. Uh, that's the this is the best conclusion because that's what I focus on the most, right? It's just what mm -hmm. you eat, and then so many things can fall into place after that. But you got to focus on that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, back in the late '60s, when we were playing high, high end ice hockey, we instinctively knew that if you ate a pizza before a hockey game, your performance sucked. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and what what the guys learned 
is when we were in a big hockey tournament, we typically ate uh, stew and chili and drank milk. Mm. We found that if you drank Coca Cola or any of the, you know, the, 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 you know, the, whatever yeah, sugar you yeah. just didn't perform worth a damn and so we instinctively just knew that and there was no such thing as gatorade on our bench or anything else like that it was in fact like noakes talks about hydration hockey players are typically hydrated the day before because you don't worry about hydrating on the bench because you don't need to mm, that's yeah. a whole nother story oh man over hydration yeah i'm not into that at all but yeah you guys ate hearty foods you ate, you yes. had dairy, you had stews and chili. I mean, this is the hearty foods that, that make your body work properly. All right. At risk of going on forever, we need to just cut well, it we off. We can have another one. Let's, let's, let's have your, your viewing audience send in their questions and let's uh, have a Q&A session. I think it'd be fun. I'd be Absolutely. happy to do that. We can do more. I have some notes that we didn't cover. We could talk about more things next time, but thank you so much for coming on k-vitamins.com check it out and uh, mm -hmm. yeah I'll, I'll maybe uh see you at a master's track meet sometime i i hope so i really hope so it's it's, it's uh it's it's gonna be fun i just uh to see uh a 68 year old run a 400 hurdles is, is kind of fun <laughs> <laughs> i love it i love it oh yeah i'm trying to stay i want to be i want to be in top shape but by, by your age and um well i'm 38 but we'll see yeah, it's kind of fun. My, my grandfather was coaching Golden Gloves boxing into his 80s, and he was five foot eight, 148 pounds, and he would jump rope with the kids that were between 13 and 20, mm. and and he would literally out jump rope them, and then wow. he would put the gloves on and go in the ring. So think about this: 80 some year old guy mm -hmm. put the gloves on, go in the ring, and sometimes spar with 10 to 20 kids in an evening for for three minutes. And just teach because grandpa was into uh, a very consistent diet, unbelievably consistent, virtually no junk carbs. And he ate the same stuff every freaking day. Mm. And he lived to be 92. Uh, he slipped on some ice, threw a clot, and had a, died of a heart attack. That year oh, we were man. supposed to go antelope hunting. Think about that. 92 That's years old, ready to go antelope hunting. And, and again, he, he lived exactly what you're talking about, a very good diet. That's and, it. Uh, what, and, and, and that's it. And uh, Grandma, she believed in Crisco, and uh -oh. Grandpa believed in butter. <laughs> oh, man. I'm not kidding you. It's just Grandpa believed in lard, which, by the way, is a good fat, by the way. Mm -hmm. Very few people see it anymore. But lard, Grandpa loved lard. And uh, so when Grandpa would do bacon and eggs, He'd cook the bacon first and then do the scrambled eggs in the bacon grease. Of course. Loved it. Of course. And he <laughs> lived well. This is this. Yeah. I mean, some of these older people had it figured out because before Crisco came yeah. in, it's like almost we didn't even have a lot of these processed foods and and they did do well. And and yes, I, I'm just saying back to I interviewed so, um, Frederick, the Sami reindeer herder, and he had a similar story about his grandpa. He's 90 something going on, mm -hmm. you know, 20 kilometer uh, snowshoe tricks just for fun mm -hmm. and coming back the same day and just help. Yeah. They're, My grandpa they're... was a Sami. My grandpa was a Sami. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. That's really good. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I'm trying to get out there at some point up into the Arctic circle and, and maybe do some interviews yeah. up there and do some filming. Yeah. Go to, go to Tornio and uh, that's your jumping off point and just, uh, just ask him, I want to talk about the Sami and how the Sami do what the Sami do. And, uh, you know, reindeer, Grandpa loved fish. Sauna, reindeer, fish, saunas, and uh, an attitude. Their attitude is we can do anything. Nothing, nothing could get us down, which is getting back to, you know, don't get all nerved up. Absolutely. It, it's yeah, it's amazing. And the last, last point, <laughs> just we've the, this is how humans should live. This is how this is how robust we can be and how long we can live. And we've just in modern society, normalized people being 80 and being in a wheelchair, being in a hospital bed, mm -hmm. being, you know, hunched over with arthritis and all kinds of conditions. And that's not at all what we can be. And it's, and people still say, Oh, well, the, you know, these, he ate the plant-based diet. Or he ate, followed the food pyramid and look at him. I'm like, yeah, he's, he's 80 and he's about to die. This is not right. thriving. Like this is not a good re reflection of, you know, this diet. 
that mm -hmm. yeah 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 I, 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 i'm with you man we can talk about the food pyramid. but i got a great story with that but not right now You'll not right it. now well <laughs> i'm making a whole film about it so we'll, we'll catch well, up again we'll catch up again uh down the road and yes send me questions for patrick thank you so much yep thank you take care now you too